just be a brief delay while it, while it streams. Of course. Hello, and thank you for joining us today as we begin the 2023 NACOL webinar series. For those of you who are not familiar with us, NACOL is an organization that strives to create a community of support for independent civilian oversight entities that seek to make their local law enforcement agencies, jails, and prisons more transparent, accountable, and responsive to the communities they serve. One piece of that effort is our webinar series, where for the last eight years, we have brought to you information on the practice of civilian oversight, innovations in the field, and important work being done in the arena of criminal justice reform. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things regarding today's logistics. With so many in attendance, everyone has entered in listen-only mode. Once today's presentation begins, you can access the area area to type in your questions by clicking the Q&A icon in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You will also have the ability to vote on questions already posed to move them up in the queue. This will help us to address the audience's most pressing questions in the short time we have together today. Also, please note that today's session is being recorded and will be available to you through Attendee Hub, the same platform you use to access today's webinar. Your same login information will allow you to watch or rewatch the sessions shortly after we conclude. With all the details out of the way, I would like to move our attention to today's speaker. I'm honored today to welcome Joanna Schwartz, who has joined us from the UCLA School of Law. Joanna is a leading expert on police misconduct litigation, and her recent scholarship includes articles empirically examining the justifications for qualified immunity doctrine, the financial impact of settlements and judgments on federal, state, and local law enforcement officers and agency budgets, and regional variation in civil rights protections across the country. She's also author of the recently released book, Shielded, How the Police Became Untouchable where she examines the many ways in which our legal system protects the police. This book is a product of her many years of research and advocacy. And with that, I would like to welcome Joanna Schwartz. Joanna? Thank you so much for having me here for this conversation. And uh, thank you to all of those uh, of you who are listening in. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to talk with you about my book, um, Shielded, how the police became untouchable. And uh, one of the reasons I'm so excited to, to get to speak with you um, is that uh, the questions that I raise in this book um, are questions that I think are, are of interest and of, of really prominent concern for uh, your organization and, and for those of you. And, and that question is uh, what can justice look like? What does justice look like? And what should justice look like for people whose constitutional rights have been violated by law enforcement or other government officials? And this is unfortunately a question that we seem to be asking ourselves with increasing frequency as our uh, screens are filled with images uh, and videos of people who are losing their lives, um, losing their dignity, um, and losing their, their uh, privacy uh, at the hands of law enforcement officers across the country. Uh, justice is something that we see written on uh, people's t-shirts and on signs uh, in protests seeking justice for George Floyd or for Breonna Taylor or for Tyree Nichols or for so many other people. And I suppose the first question is, what does justice mean? What is it that, that people want? Uh, often family members or people whose rights themselves have been violated say that they want some accounting, some recognition, uh, some compensation or or other making whole um, after uh, whatever has has happened to them, and also looking forward, want some uh, ability to know that something similar won't happen to someone else in the future. Um, and as I talk about in Shielded, there are really three paths towards some kind of 
justice along the lines that people hope for. And none of those paths is easy to travel. One is uh, criminal prosecution. Officers can be criminally prosecuted uh, when they violate people's rights. Um, but as those of you on this call um, likely know, uh, criminal prosecutions are, are extremely unlikely. The, the best available evidence that we have is that 2% of people who are killed by police um, ever uh, have the criminal uh, prosecutions against their officers. And about a third of those cases, there are convictions. If you're talking about um, non-deadly uses of force or other kinds of civil rights violations, the rates for criminal prosecution and conviction uh, fall sharply. Uh, another path towards some form of justice is through police departments, internal uh, investigations, discipline, and firing of officers. And I hardly need to tell those of you who are listening in to this call, given your areas of expertise, uh, that investigations and decisions to discipline or fire um, are often... <coughs> bound by outsiders looking in to be inadequate, uh, whether because um, those conducting the investigations don't have uh, the sort of time or incentive um, to dig deeply into those allegations of misconduct or because uh, law enforcement officers, bills of rights, and other union-related uh, agreements create shields uh, preventing those complete investigations uh, or even in the rare instance in which there is a finding of wrongdoing and discipline or termination, uh, there are reviews, review levels of review, uh, arbitration, and other kinds of reconsideration that end up meaning that many of those decisions are overturned. So for many people whose rights have been violated and who are seeking justice, Filing a lawsuit, naming an officer or perhaps the department uh, that employed that officer or the local government that employed that officer uh, is the best <coughs> available means of seeking some kind of justice. And in many ways, that approach by filing a civil suit is better uh, in theory to achieve those goals. Um, in uh, a lawsuit, a person whose rights have been violated can bring that suit themselves. They don't have to wait for a prosecutor or an internal affairs investigator to act. Uh, once a complaint is filed, a lawsuit is filed, the parties to that case can unearth and share publicly often <coughs> information uh, about what happened in the case, which is information that a prosecutor or internal affairs investigator in many instances, although I know that there's variation, um, in many instances are not obligated to make public. And if there is a finding of wrongdoing, a person whose rights have been violated by the police can get money to compensate them for their uh, harms and can also get forward-looking relief in the form of policy changes um, or other kinds of prospective changes, which are remedies that aren't available through criminal complaints or through internal affairs uh, processes. And so for those reasons, as I say, in theory, uh, lawsuits are the best available means for many to seek some form of justice. But as I detail in my book, that path um, is blocked in many ways, shielded in many ways by decisions by the Supreme Court and state and local governments uh, that make it very difficult to go down that path. Now, I should say at the outset, although uh, the shields that I'm about to describe make it difficult or impossible for many people to get relief through the courts, not everyone is barred remedy. And in fact, when you read the news uh, for those who are, are less deeply engaged in this work. Uh, and you see reports that George Floyd's family received um, $27 million uh, to settle their case. Breonna Taylor 
and many others whose names have become household words have received uh, multi-million dollar settlements in these cases without having to overcome any of the barriers that I've described in this book. But what is important to understand and keep in mind is that the barriers to relief in these cases tend to lose much of their power in cases that receive a great deal of political attention, protests, and the like. Instead, the shields that I'm focused on tend to do their work in cases about which people have never heard, cases that haven't received that same level of public scrutiny, attention, and condemnation. And so I wanted to read to you um, one of those stories. My book is filled with stories of people whose names you haven't heard. Um, whose rights have been violated and who have sought relief in the courts. But I wanted to just start to give you a little sense with, with just one of those stories. And it's the, it's the beginning of the, of the book, of the introduction. On the afternoon of February 8th, 2018, more than two dozen law enforcement officers crowded into a conference room in the Henry County Sheriff's Office on the outskirts of Atlanta. They were preparing to execute a no-knock warrant at 305 English Road the home of a drug dealer who'd been under investigation for almost two years and had gathered for a briefing about the operation. The special agent leading the briefing told the team that 305 English Road was a small house with off-white siding and several broken down cars out front, showed them an aerial photograph of the house and gave them turn by turn directions to get there. All of the members of the task force had the opportunity to review a copy of the warrant which described the target house and its surroundings. But only one, Captain David Cody, who was leading the operation, took the time to read it. And even Captain Cody didn't read it all the way through. The officers piled into their SUVs to head to 305 English Road, but ignored the directions they received during the briefing. Instead, an officer plugged the address into the GPS on his cell phone and the convoy got lost. When the officers finally arrived at their destination, the house described in the warrant was right in front of them, run down, off white, with cars strewn across the yard. But the entry team walked swiftly past 305 English Road and toward 303 English Road, 40 yards away. The house at 303 English Road looked nothing like the house described in the briefing and in the warrant. It was tidy and yellow with a carefully maintained grass yard. The mailbox at the end of the driveway made abundantly clear that it was not the house the task force was looking for. Yet less than a minute after getting out of their cars, officers deployed flash grenades outside 303 English Road and used battering rams to smash open all three doors of the home. Inside, they found Henri Norris, a 78-year-old black man wearing a baseball cap, jeans, and a windbreaker. For more than 50 years, until February 8th, 2018, Norris had lived peacefully at 303 English Road. He and his wife had raised their three children there. He had spent decades traveling back and forth from that home to his job at a nearby rock quarry. Now Norris was retired and lived alone. Although he was still married to his wife, they got along better living separately and saw each other on Sundays at church. His children had grown up, moved away, and had children of their own. Norris was no drug dealer. He had never been in any trouble with the law. He'd never even received a traffic ticket. Henri Norris was watching the evening news in an armchair in his bedroom when he heard a thunderous sound as if a bomb had gone off in his house. He got up to see what the commotion was and found a crowd of men in military gear in his hallway. Norris was more than twice as old as the target of the search but the officers pointed assault rifles at him anyway and yelled at him to raise his hands and get on the ground. When Norris told the officers that his knees were in bad shape, an officer grabbed Norris, pushed him down and twisted his arm behind his back. Norris's chest began to hurt and he had trouble breathing. He told the officers that he had heart trouble. He'd had bypass surgery and used a pacemaker, but they kept him on the ground for several minutes and never sought medical care. Norris was eventually picked up and led outside in handcuffs. 
When the officers realized that they had blasted their way into the wrong house, they turned their cameras off one by one. So Henri Norris and his family, his children and his grandchildren wanted justice. They wanted to make sure that something like this never happened again. And they wanted some compensation and recognition for the injuries that he had suffered. Henri Norris uh, filed a civilian complaint that nothing ever came of. There was never any question that the officers might be criminally prosecuted. Now, Captain Cody and some of his other deputies did come to the house to help put a few of the doors that they had busted down back on their hinges. But that was not enough for Mr. Norris. And so he, with the help of a lawyer, filed a lawsuit alleging that the officers had violated his Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, his case was thrown out of court, and it was a defense that has gotten a lot of attention in recent years called qualified immunity. That was the reason the court dismissed Henri Norris's claims. Qualified immunity is a defense that was created by the Supreme Court in 1967 as a good faith defense for officers who violated the Constitution but believed that they were following the law. In recent years, though, the protections of qualified immunity have shifted and grown dramatically, such that officers' intent no longer matters. In fact, they can act with evil intent. The question becomes whether they, off, whether they violated a clearly established law. And what the Supreme Court has said repeatedly is that the law must be very similar. The prior court decision that declares something unconstitutional must be extremely similar with facts particularized to the facts of the case before the court, such that any officer would know that what he or she was doing violated the law. In many parts of the country, that prior decision holding unconstitutional, nearly identical conduct uh, must not only exist, but it must be published, meaning publicly available uh, it through, not, not just publicly available, but published in the books that, um, that state the, the state of the law. And to give you a sense of just how that works and what these barriers can look like, I wanna read you a little bit about the qualified immunity decision in Henri Norris's case. It was uh, the judges who heard Norris's case agreed that the officers searched his home without a warrant and that searching a house without a warrant is presumptively unreasonable. The judges also recognized that officers who execute a search warrant on the wrong home violate the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution unless they have made a, quote, reasonable effort to ascertain and identify the place intended to be searched. In fact, the very same court <laughs> that decided Norris's case in 2021 had ruled five years earlier that it was unconstitutional for an officer who executed a warrant on the wrong home to detain its residents at gunpoint, almost exactly what had happened to Henri Norris. But that prior decision was not enough to defeat qualified immunity in Norris's case because it was unpublished, meaning it was available online, but not in the books of decisions that are issued each year, and so was not technically binding on the court. The court declined to publish its decision in Norris's case as well. So if in the future, officers hold the wrong person at gunpoint after executing a search warrant at the wrong house, the law still won't be clearly established and those officers can receive qualified immunity too. This uh, reality of qualified immunity, that it shields officers from liability even when they have violated the constitution, so long as they have the good luck to have violated the constitution in a way not precisely held unconstitutional in a published case before, is I think the reason that qualified immunity has gotten so much attention in recent years, because there are case after case uh, with egregious facts where officers have been granted qualified immunity and shielded from liability. But part of the point that I wish to make in shielded 
is that qualified immunity is only the tip of the iceberg. Instead, there are barriers to access and relief at every stage of the litigation process uh, that make it difficult for people, even people who have had their rights violated, to file their case in court, litigate their case to conclusion and win. The first challenge uh, comes at the very beginning of the case, which is finding a lawyer to represent you. Now, looking at sort of contemporary uh, images and descriptions of lawyers, it should seem like finding a lawyer to uh, take a case in which a person's constitutional rights were violated should be no problem at all. In fact, if you look at you know, common depictions, you would think that courthouses are simply overflowing with lawyers who are eager to take these kinds of cases. But that depiction and that assumption is wrong. Uh, what I've found in my research is that many lawyers who bring civil rights cases bring civil rights cases among several other kinds of cases that they bring, including personal injury, medical malpractice, criminal defense. And what those lawyers will tell you, and dozens of them have told me, is that bringing a civil rights case is far more difficult, far riskier, far, uh, far less uh, financially sensible a case to take across the board. Uh, part of this is because of all of the other barriers to relief like qualified immunity that make uh, these cases so difficult to, br to, pr to bring and then prevail on. And part of it is the way in which these lawyers are paid. Uh, lawyers who bring civil rights cases as well as personal injury cases and medical malpractice cases basically consider to, whether to bring these cases on a contingency fee basis, looking at the possible um, benefits of bringing the case, what they might win if they prevail, and what they would, uh, how much they'll have to spend bringing the case if they lose, recognizing that they will recover nothing if they lose and probably a third uh, or some other percentage of their clients' winnings if they prevail. The Supreme Court uh, uh, has basically enforced and created this uh, contingency fee system in civil rights cases, despite the fact that Congress in the 70s allowed for essentially uh, plaintiffs in civil rights cases to get their fees from the defendant anytime that they were successful. And Congress created this fee shifting statute with the recognition that it was important for people whose civil rights have been violated to be able to find a lawyer and to be able to have that lawyer get paid. Uh, but the Supreme Court interpreted that fee shifting statute, which is referred to as uh, Section 1988, um, in a way that allowed defendants to offer settlement agreements that would waive the plaintiff's entitlement to attorney's fees. And Unsurprisingly, um, most cases settle and most of those settlement agreements allow for, provide for the waiver of plaintiff's attorney's right for fees, which ends up meaning that this contingency fee system is back in place. And uh, because of the costs of bringing these cases, because of the risks of bringing these cases, because of the fact that many of the plaintiffs or possible plaintiffs in these cases um, may not be uh, in the lawyer's view, sympathetic to judges or juries, whether because of their criminal history, because they don't have stable employment, because uh, of their uh, gender or sexual orientation, race, uh, ethnicity, um, or, or other factors, people whose rights have been violated um, may simply not be able to find a lawyer willing to represent them. And I talk about uh, in the book, a family from Syracuse, New York, who uh, clearly had their rights violated, but could find no one in Syracuse or anywhere in the surrounding <coughs> area to represent them. No one in New York wanted to drive uh, eight hours round trip to, uh, to take their case and eventually found a lawyer who practices in the Bay Area, but is very committed to this work and willing to travel across country for cases that he believes in to pursue this litigation. Uh, if you find a lawyer, once you find a lawyer, then you need to file a complaint. And the complaint uh, 
has long been viewed as requiring only what the federal rules of civil procedure called a short and plain statement of the facts and the, the laws violated and the entitlement to relief. But the Supreme Court in 2007 and then in 2009 made clear that plaintiffs now have to file what they call a plausible complaint, a complaint that has enough facts in it so that the judge exercising their, <coughs> quote, judicial experience and common sense, uh, view this as a plausible entitlement to relief. And it's not every civil rights case that stumbles over this requirement. For example, Henri Norris knew with particularity what had happened to him and who had violated his rights and so could plead a detailed complaint. But in cases particularly cases where people have died in police custody and their family members don't know what happened to them, uh, it can be very difficult to overcome this plausible pleading requirement. I tell the story in the book about a woman named Vicki Timpa uh, who got a call from the Dallas Police Department that her son, Tony, had died in police custody. Uh, Tony was a white, executive making a quarter of a million dollars a year and <laughs> had not been in any serious trouble with the law. She could not imagine what had happened to her son, um, why he, how he could have died in police custody. Uh, the Dallas Police Department would give her no information. They had body camera video of what had happened and would not turn that over as a matter of Texas law. Uh, they, they weren't required to while an investigation was ongoing. And so uh, Vicki Timpa and her lawyer filed really a bare bones complaint against the city of Dallas, naming John Doe officers, um, meaning she didn't have their identities, and uh, alleging that the city and its officers had violated her son's constitutional rights. The city of Dallas then moved to dismiss that case uh, saying that the complaint was not plausibly pled, didn't include enough details about how her son had died um, in order to state this plausible entitlement to relief. Now, the irony here, or the cruelty perhaps, is that the city of Dallas had in their own possession the video camera from the officer's body cams that identified who the officers were and precisely how Tony Timpa had died. Um, but they were saying in the complaint, her, her pleadings were not plausible. Luckily for her, her lawyer was able to file a separate lawsuit um, after filing a public records request that was denied and was able to negotiate release of the body camera video to Timpa and her lawyer while the motion to dismiss was pending. And so they were able to amend their complaint and get past that barrier to relief. But there's many people out there uh, who do not um, have a lawyer who would be willing to file a essentially a separate litigation on their behalf, especially given the contingency fee relationship that I just described. And this was also a unique case in that there was body camera video that could be turned over, that could reveal the details of what had happened. So for many people without those circumstances, uh, they may not be able to plead a plausible complaint and may never be able to get to the discovery that would reveal to them what actually happened to their loved one. Once you get past finding a lawyer and once you get past uh, pleading the complaint, the next big barrier to relief is the constitution itself. And most cases brought against police officers are brought as violations of the fourth amendment. And, and the key language in the Fourth Amendment is unreasonable searches and seizures. If you hear that language, uh, or certainly when I hear that language, I imagine that unreasonableness relates to the person who has been searched or seized. So if I'm walking down the street, I've done nothing wrong, the fact that an officer would arrest me or uh, put their hands on me, assault me, kill me, uh, if I've done nothing wrong, that seems intrinsically unreasonable. But the way in which the Supreme Court interprets the Fourth Amendment is from the perspective of the officer, not the perspective of the person whose Fourth Amendment rights are uh, being protected. And what that means is that an officer can stop someone, <coughs> arrest someone, 
assault someone, kill someone who has done nothing wrong. If the officer believes in the moment and was objectively reasonably believing that the person uh, had committed a crime or was uh, a risk to others, they can intrude uh, and violate, or in my view, uh, that person's entitlement to their bodily integrity um, uh, without having violated the constitution. And I tell uh, the stories of, of a few people um, in the book who have suffered just that kind of harm, even though they had done nothing wrong. And courts in those cases refer to the officer's conduct as tragic, uh, but not as a violation of constitutional rights. It's only after you get through finding a lawyer, pleading a complaint, and proving a constitutional violation that qualified immunity comes into the picture. And as I mentioned before, qualified immunity protects officers, even if they have violated the constitution, so long as they have not violated what the court calls clearly established law, which in practice means there has to be a prior court decision with nearly identical facts in order for that officer to be held liable. Turning to local government liability, uh, many believe in many of these cases, and I, I believe that in many of these cases, we are not facing uh, bad apples, but rotten barrels, that there are systemic problems in police departments that lead to these instances of individualized instances of misconduct. And the Supreme Court has held that local governments can be held liable for wrongdoing of their officers. However, uh, the Supreme Court has made very clear that local governments are not what's called vicariously liable for misconduct by their officers. That's in, in private business. If you were hit by a, a truck, that's ABC Foods truck, uh, the claim that you would bring would not be against the individual driver, but against the ABC food truck company, um, who would be better able to satisfy the settlement and judgment and who would have the incentive to make adjustments to prevent something like that from happening in the future. But not so in when it comes to civil rights violations. When it comes to civil rights violations, a plaintiff bringing a claim against a local government has to show that there was a uh, policy that expressly allowed the constitutional violation, that the, the chief policymaker, usually the police chief, was the one who personally violated the person's rights or uh, ratified the violation of the person's rights after the fact, or, and these are the more common types of claims, that there was a custom or a practice of violating people's rights or a failure to adequately discipline uh, hire and train its officers. And those standards are extremely difficult to meet. And as I describe in the book um, regarding a uh, police department in uh, Vallejo, California, uh, where uh, more people uh, have been killed per capita than all but one of the 100 largest police departments in the country, and there is proof that officers would bend their badges in celebration of police shootings. Uh, I have found that officers uh, involved in those instances and repeatedly involved in uh, shootings, they refer to themselves uh, as the fatal 14, 14 of the 100 officers who are involved in multiple uh, cases. None of those officers have been disciplined, fired, um, or none, none of those cases have resulted in a finding that the city of Vallejo is responsible uh, for creating this culture for not adequately disciplining and supervising its officers. And that failure is a direct relation, has a direct relationship to the Supreme Court's standards. Um, even when there's findings of liability, even when a person gets past all of those barriers to relief, then there's the question of what impact a judgment or a settlement in these cases actually has. And as I describe in the book, um, the, uh, the ways in which local governments budget for and pay settlements and judgments in these cases 
mean that officers virtually never contribute anything to settlements and judgments entered against them. And local police departments very rarely have any skin in the game either. Settlements and judgments in these cases do not impact uh, local governments uh, budgeting for those police departments. I've also found in my research, I've actually spoken to NACOL at a, at a conference uh, several years ago about this topic. Um, police departments don't tend to gather and analyze information from these lawsuits either. They're very uh, valuable sources of information. They're not perfect, um, but police departments are, are used to sorting through imperfect information all the time when they, when they solve crimes. Uh, yet police departments don't tend to gather and analyze information from these lawsuits with an eye toward um, identifying what happened, what failures happened, and how to improve in the future. Now, many of these protections have been justified over the years by concerns about what it would mean if there were too much justice, if there was too much access to justice. And over the past several decades, the same type of uh, horror story has been told repeatedly that courthouses would be filled to the brim with frivolous cases, that officers would be bankrupted for um, reasonable mistakes that they made in the course of the job, and that faced with that threat of liability, no one would agree to be a police officer uh, or police officers would not vigorously enforce the law and society would essentially descend into chaos. And a version of that story has been told repeatedly in Supreme Court decisions um, and statements by legislators. Um, I have spent about 15 years examining empirically the justifications for these various shields that have been erected to protect police and other government officials. And what I've found is that these claims are at the very least overblown, and in many instances, they are just plain false. Um, to take qualified immunity for a moment, in current debate and in long, long past uh, debate, uh, about qualified immunity. The claim has repeatedly been made that officers will be bankrupted for good faith mistakes. Um, but as I show in uh, Shielded and in my prior research, police officers virtually never pay anything. And it's not qualified immunity that is the protection. It is instead um, indemnification agreements, agreements that are passed or policies that are put into place in local governments and in state legislators, le legislatures that provide that when an officer is sued, that he or she will be provided with an attorney and settlements or judgments will be paid from the general budget without an impact on the officer. Uh, the idea that officers are going to be held liable for reasonable mistakes made in a split second is also uh, overlooking the, the Fourth Amendment and the way in which the Supreme Court has interpreted the Fourth Amendment, which explicitly allows officers to make reasonable mistakes and recognizes that officers have to make mis uh, decisions in a split second and sometimes err. And so the idea that qualified immunity is necessary for those protections of officers' bank accounts when they make uh, good faith mistakes in a split second is directly uh, countervened by evidence that I have gathered and that is widespread uh, of these indemnification agreements and of the protections of the Fourth Amendment. So I wrote this book to really try to uh, make that evidence publicly available and, and available not just to people who like to read law review articles on the weekends, but to people who haven't uh, gone to law school, for people who are um, just learning about these areas of the law, and part of this, a reason I'm, I'm so excited to get to speak with you is that the, the, I know that many of you have been deeply involved in, um, er, in, in this area or areas adjacent to it, but it, it, I, I have heard from others, and I, and I hope that you find it true as well, that the book really sets out um, chapter by chapter by chapter each of these barriers what they mean, how they how they uh, work in practice, what the justifications are for these doctrines, and how they intersect and relate. And I do this telling the stories again of people whose 
um, rights have been violated, whose stories you have not heard of before, um, who have sought justice in the courts um, and either found that it was far more difficult than it should have been to get the relief that they sought um, or have been de denied relief uh, altogether. And um, it's been very meaningful to me to be able to tell some of these stories that haven't gotten public attention, even though they should. Um, this book came out on uh, Valentine's Day, which I thought was sort of a funny day to release a book about police misconduct and accountability. But I spoke to Vicki Timpa a few weeks after the book came out, who's the mother of Tony Timpa, who had been killed in Dallas Police Department custody. And she thought that Valentine's Day was a perfect day to release this book because it was in some ways a message or a or a, a message of love um, for her, for her child. And um, that was very meaningful to me. Um, and it's been meaningful to hear from, from other people whose stories I tell in the book that having some public recognition, public airing of what happened to them um, is in itself a small measure of justice in their cases. Um, I spend, most of the book, 12 of the 13 chapters, really going through all of these barriers to relief. But I do offer in uh, chapter 13, uh, what I title the, the chapter as is a better way. And, and I do try to offer some meaningful reforms that can be put in place um, to make this system of accountability work better. And there are certainly a lot that the Supreme Court could do or Congress could do tomorrow to take away some of these barriers to relief. But my focus is much more at the state and local level where I think that there is important work that can be done um, and is being done in some places to limit interactions between uh, police and community members. Um, we're seeing across the country that there are limits that are being put on the ability of police to stop um, people for low level traffic uh, violations, um, limits on <coughs> police involvement um, in calls where people are in a state of mental health crisis. Um, and I also think that there's important work that can be done on the back end if people's rights have been violated to give them more justice through the courts. Uh, Colorado, New Mexico, and New York City have all passed legislation that does a lot uh, in relation to police reform. But, but one thing it does is create a state law right to sue without qualified immunity as a defense. And, and that's the kind of legislation that's been considered in a lot of places. Um, although in many places, those efforts have been unsuccessful in part, in significant part, because of <laughs> these unsupported myths um, about the dangers of eliminating qualified immunity. Uh, there's also important work that's been done in New York City and elsewhere to uh, get police departments to pay more attention to the information in lawsuits um, that have been brought against them uh, with an eye toward reducing the likelihood of, fur of further misconduct. And those efforts have proven successful. My hope is that as efforts prove successful, as some of this local experimentation happens, that those findings, the effects of those uh, results can then be used to, to push for change um, in more in more places across the country. And I know that many of you on this call are also working in, in important ways to try to improve the other aspect, uh, another path uh, toward justice through the internal affairs and internal um, police department investigations, uh, discipline and oversight. And, and those efforts are uh, exceedingly important as well. <laughs> Um, I really look forward to your um, comments. I thought I would just close with one last very short um, reading from the introduction that I think encapsulates um, my ambitions for the book. I write, we cannot wait for another viral video to restart our national conversation about police violence and reform. And we must foreground the realities of civil rights litigation when we do. Myths about the dangers of making it too easy to sue police have made a mess of our system. A shared understanding of how officers are shielded from the consequences of their actions 
and how those shields leave many victims without a meaningful remedy must fuel a reimagining of what it means to hold government accountable and what it means to protect and serve. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to your comments and questions. Joanna, thank you so much uh, for sharing your book with us. Um, for those of you who have not had a chance to read it, I would highly recommend it, um, particularly for those of you out there doing the work and, and looking for more information um, about kind of the broader sphere of, of what all of us are trying to do here. So um, we do have a couple of questions that um, I would like to share to, with you um, in our remaining minutes together. Um, first of all, um, you state it is difficult to sue police and find lawyers for these cases. How do we reconcile that with the reality that nationally cities and counties spend many hundreds of millions of dollars annually in settlements and judgments? Well, I think um, we can reconcile it a couple of different ways. One is to say that um, people can still find lawyers in cases involving grievous physical harm because the the sort of amount of damages that that are potentially recoverable um, you know make make it make financial sense to bring those kinds of cases. Um, I quote a lawyer in the book as saying, you know, it sounds crass, but is there blood on the street? And uh, if not, why are we taking this case? Um, so there are still cases that are being brought, but they tend to be cases in which people are killed, um, cases in which uh, people are very grievous, grievously injured. But there are many other constitutional violations uh, where people have been arrested, held for a few days, held for a few hours, handcuffed on the side of the street, strip searched, um, you know, retaliated against by being arrested when they tried to record the police, um, uh, you know, other physical injuries that that don't result in long lasting permanent harm or death, um, which are also constitutional violations, which are also important in my view to protect. Um, and those people don't find lawyers. Um, there was a Supreme Court case called Taylor versus Riojas that very recently came, uh, was decided <laughs> by the Supreme Court involving a, a prisoner who was held in Texas prisons or in a Texas prison in for six days in absolutely horrifying conditions. Uh, he was naked. He was held in a cell that was freezing cold, covered with human waste from the ceiling to the floor. Um, and Sam Alito, Justice Samuel Alito said that these were shocking conditions. The, the unsigned opinion said any officer should have known that these conditions were unconstitutional. Uh, but Trent Taylor could not find a lawyer to represent him. He didn't have a lawyer uh, in the trial court or the court of appeals. He litigated by himself with the help of a jailhouse lawyer. Um, and it was only after his his the decision in the court of appeals got some public attention that a lawyer found the case and was you know willing to represent him. But he had he had written to dozens of lawyers who said that you know I can't afford to bring this case that you know we cannot afford to bring this case the risks outweigh. And he had talked to public interest organizations and private attorneys and 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 the like. So this there there is a, a lot of evidence of this. Now I I also want to to talk about the the hundreds of millions of dollars spent in these cases. It is true that, um, and there are news reports that, you know, that document that across the country, yes, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent in these cases. And I think in Chicago, a half a billion dollars was spent over a decade. It's also important to put those numbers in some context. Um, when I studied uh, settlements and judgments in police misconduct cases across the country, the payments in these cases amounted to less than 1% of local government's budgets, and in many places, far less than, you know, 1%, you know, one-tenth of 1%. Um, and important also to compare this to 
uh, law enforcement budgets in these same jurisdictions that can be a quarter to a third to more than a third um, of the entirety <laughs> of the budgets. So we're talking about um, less than 1% being paid in these cases versus you know, a third a third or more sometimes um, of the city's or the or the county's budget going toward the law the police department. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a few more questions here. So the next one is, couldn't insurance firms and risk pools for public entities enforce requirements on police departments as a condition of coverage of liability risks? Yeah, great question. And I've done some research about this. I talk about this a little bit in the book, <laughs> um, but it's absolutely true. In smaller jurisdictions that rely on municipal liability insurance, either through private insurance or pooled municipal insurance, those insurance companies can put really important um, directed, targeted pressure on departments to improve. And I've seen examples of this uh, in research that I have done and that others have done, um, one example that I that comes to mind is uh, a, a pooled insurer in Idaho. I spoke to the risk manager for that pooled insurance uh, provider who uh, that insured um, uh, sheriff's departments in Idaho. He told me that they had done sort of a risk assessment of all of their um, insureds and saw that the jails in Idaho had, you know, there were several um, issues that arose <laughs> again and again. And the insurance, the insurance company or the, the pooled insurer decided to require for the con the for insurance, for future insurance, that these uh sheriff's departments have eight different um kinds of uh, protections that they had seen from prior cases. I can't remember what they all are, but you know, one was to have a uh, medical a health provider on call or on um on the premises. Another was to have at least two deputies, you know, on um, call at any or on on staff at any given time. And it, it, the the risk manager did relate that, you know, they made those requirements. They said we're going to drop you um, or dramatically increase your premiums in, unless you don't. And almost all of them did comply. And that that is a really important lever for change. I actually think that insurers. May be uh, have may have more leverage or or greater willingness to exercise their leverage leverage than local governments, city councils, um, because when you're thinking of a city council um, or county council putting requirements on a police department, there's all sorts of uh, political pressures uh, in, against doing that, union pressures, uh, police official pressures, but insurers are responding to dollars and cents you know they are not required to you know the the, the new york new york city can't just say we're not going to use you anymore uh, or not going to pay your settlements and judgments anymore nypd but an insurer can say you guys are too you know to a small jurisdiction you guys are too risky and we're gonna we're gonna increase our premiums or we're just gonna stop covering you altogether um and that that kind of financial pressure can really cut through some of the political um, pressures against uh, making those kinds of reforms. So moving on, could you speak a little bit more about the challenges of establishing precedent with qualified immunity cases, given courts are not required to publish opinions? And how, how can this be reconciled? It's a real mind bender. Um, qualified immunity is a, is a mind bender in many different ways. Uh, and the one that you describe is 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 among them. So um, and I'll and and actually to add insult to injury, uh, the Supreme Court, as I said, has told plaintiffs, you have to find a prior court case with nearly identical facts in order to defeat qualified immunity. But the Supreme Court has also told lower courts, that they can grant qualified immunity without ruling on whether the constitution was violated. So that fact makes things uh, particularly difficult for plaintiffs. Add to that, that in um, several circuits, the circuit rule is that unpublished opinions cannot be used um, to clearly establish 
the law. So that's not true everywhere. The Ninth Circuit, where I where I uh, am, uh, the the courts do allow you to rely on uh, unpublished cases. I think they can't be the only proof that you have, but they can sort of help bolster that the law is clearly established. But in other places, um, a, a, a case that's not published can't be used to clearly establish the law. And it's particularly uh, nonsensical. It's nonsensical for many reasons in my view, but, but particularly because the way in which people nowadays read cases is on Westlaw um, or on you know, another publicly available um, electronic uh, database. And so whether something is technically published in a book, um, you know, before there was decisions limiting how many decisions could be published because the idea was that they would actually physically be in bound books. There's not that same limitation now. Um, so it, it makes very little sense. Um, this is something that, um, that others have, have been writing about and thinking about how to address. Um, and certainly one, one way would be to prohibit um, the publication of, of or pr prohibit unpublished decisions. And another would be to allow that unpublished decisions um, could clearly establish the law for qualified immunity purposes. Um, and I suppose a third is advocating to judges that they should designate all of their qualified immunity decisions um, as published so that they can help clarify the law moving forward. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. We'll try to get them in. Um, so in your years of research, have you found any connection related to the issues that are obvious in many police departments? Executive leaders try to change the narrative and they are asked to resign or be terminated. Have I, I mean, I think that, I think that, I guess I, what I would say is I think that when outsiders like the Department of Justice come in and do an investigation or when there is is sort of large scale investigations, whether by journalists or lawyers um, of police departments, I think we see again and again and again the same kinds of deficiencies, the same kinds of, uh, you know, sort of leadership looking the other way, uh, failing to engage with their um you know, with the problems that they are that they are facing, and then I, I think as the question goes to um, perhaps sort of in those moments, then leadership may resign, and then there's new leadership put in, and you know the the underlying um, problems don't don't seem to to change. Um, so I I do think that that is a, a very common theme that we um, see in policing, and. Uh, you know, in, 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 in my view, and I'm really taking the approach of thinking about civil litigation and what role it can and should play in this process, um, if there was a, a you know, a, a, a stronger mechanism to hold local governments liable under the law, um, perhaps that would shift. Um, if police departments were financially um, responsible for settlements and judgments in their cases, perhaps that would shift um, by providing some sort of legal or financial um, incentive to to adjust their their behavior. Um, but but right now there really there really isn't um, consequences for that repeat bad behavior. Again, thank you for that. I, I would like. Unfortunately, we have many more questions, but we've run out of time. So I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to you, Joanna, for joining us today to share your knowledge, your work, um, and your perspectives with the civilian oversight community. Uh, NACL could not do what it does without those who are so willing to share their knowledge and expertise. So thank you very much. Absolutely. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for, for listening in. Um, I'll say if you want to, I can put in my in the chat. If you if you're interested in learning more about the book, um, I I do have this website, um, which is my name dot net. Um, you, you should explore, um, and you know it also has my my contact information, um, and and you're you're welcome to to reach out. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that, and we'll make sure that that also goes in our follow up meeting or email to our attendees so that they can take. It's a great resource, so um, I would highly encourage everyone to visit. 
Um, so I also want to thank our attendees for taking time to join us today for one of NACL's many learning opportunities. Our next event in the NACL webinar series will be taking place on June 7th. We will be um, welcoming Dr. Ye Yael Granot from Smith College, who will be joining us to discuss bias in the interpretation of video evidence. Please watch your inboxes as registration will be opening later this week. Also, please mark your calendars for May 15th when registration for NACL's 20th, 29th annual conference will, take, uh, will open. This year's conference will take place November 12th through the 16th in Chicago. Our schedule includes sessions geared towards those practicing oversight of police, jails, and prisons. We'll provide training that will build better oversight, take a look at innovation and collaboration in the field, and examine the importance of community and oversight. Thank you again for being with us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time.